this land of ours and fill sportsman's dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the highest fishing hole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. And we'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. Hello, sportsmen. Hey, if you're an upland bird hunter, you know that a good dog will increase your success and your enjoyment of hunting. But how do you train a pointing dog or retrieving dog from a puppy? Well, Mark Raymond from Clearpoint Dog Training will show us step-by-step -step how he trains championship German shorthairs. This will get us ready for Michigan's pheasant opener, which is next week's show. Right now, you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost, and you're watching The Practical Sportsman. Give. Good girl. The ring neck pheasant. This was once the king of game birds in the Midwest. In the 1960s, the population started dropping everywhere in the country. Nowadays, hunters are finding that pheasants are starting to come back. But the best way to hunt pheasants like this is with a dog. Pointing breeds are preferred. They can scent a pheasant, let you know where it's sitting, and then you can flush it. Now, we're going to get the inside scoop on one man's training methods for sporting dogs. But, you know, everybody who has a dog faces similar problems. Let's find out how the Steiners keep 10 retrievers healthy and clean. Sporting dogs are often kept outside a good share of the time. Bob and Alice Steiner just built a new kennel facility. They call it Marshland Kennels because they train Labrador Retrievers. The Steiners didn't want dog houses with chains in the yard. They wanted first-class runs, clean and easy to maintain. Well, when we put it in, we'd had enough experience cleaning up after these animals that we wanted to make it as easy as possible. So we decided that we were going to put in a system so that all we had to do was hose them down and... Uh, the uh, waste matter would be taken care of uh, environmentally correct, and uh, that's what we did. So we put in the uh, extended run with a trough. It's a, a pipe, a PVC pipe cut in half. It catches all the waste and runs it into the septic tank and then out into a drain line. So, so you built a septic tank just like you would for a home, right. just for the kennels. Right. Is that cost effective? Uh, well, no matter, we aren't really too worried about that. We were more concerned with uh, what we were going to do with all the waste from 10 dogs and uh, how we were going to be able to handle that without a system to handle it for us. And this is really the, the easiest way to do it. And I imagine it keeps the dogs a lot healthier. Well, the runs are cleaner. It's, we can do it more often because it's much easier to do. We can hose them down and uh, put the uh, antiseptics on the runs and hose it down and it all goes into the septic system. Of course, you have chain link fence. That's about the most expensive way to go too, isn't it? Well, it is, but it's the, the safest. You get some dogs that will gnaw on the fence and they want to pull it and try to get to some other dog or whatever, and this is a good enough quality fence to keep them apart. Now on the inside, of course, they go through those swinging doors mm -hmm. and they have the inside part, which stays warm in the winter. Right. <clears throat> we don't try to heat it so that their coats don't develop. We want it to be uh, so that the water doesn't freeze. And that's all we want to keep it in is uh, about 40 to 45 degrees so that the water doesn't freeze and they have fresh water all the time. And if that was heated in there? Well, if it was heated in there, their coats don't develop. And then when they get ready to go uh, bluebell hunting, for example, on the last weekend in November uh, up on Saginaw Bay and they have to swim through ice patches and whatnot, uh, their coats haven't developed well enough to protect them keep them warm then. And also, uh, for their own protection all year round, they need to have those uh, coats. Chain link fences, concrete floors, and a separate septic tank may seem a bit extravagant, but to the Steiners, convenience has many benefits. You might be able to incorporate some of these ideas into a practical home kennel for your sporting dog. Okay, what I've got here is about a five and a half month old short hair pup. And I wanted to show a few of the things that you use, equipment used in training, and a few things not to do, how to use the equipment 
and when to use equipment. We'll start here with the retrieving dummy. And as you can see, I've got the dog on a check cord. That way I've got control. When you start play retrieve, and that's what it is, it's a play retrieve. You're not forcing him to do anything that he doesn't want to. You're building on a natural retrieving instinct. And he's gonna hopefully get excited here. We'll get it. Atta boy. Come on. Come on. Come on, Atta boy. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Good boy. Atta boy. You see, he didn't want to bring that to me, but with just a little coaxing and a light tug, you can bring him in each time. Teach him that this is fun. Go get it. That a boy. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get it. Get it, boy. That a boy. Good boy. Give. Good boy. That a boy. Now, this is something I've had problems with people doing this 20 times a day. They say my dog loves to retrieve. Retrieves 20 times every day. I get the toy out and over and over. Next thing you know, he's bored with it and he doesn't want to do it anymore. So I'll do it with a dog maybe every other day, every third day, two or three times, and then tease him with it and put it away. Leave him, always leave him wanting more. You don't want to do it until he's bored. But if you keep a cord on him, you've got control and he can't run off and play with it and play chase me games. Okay, well, I got a pole here. I want to show you another thing that, a mistake that most people make with a puppy that don't know anything on training, they've heard you use a wing on a pole and they'll do this over and over and over again until a dog is, is either sick of pointing and he ignores it or he starts wanting to sight point and a pointing dog scent points. When you're out hunting a, a pheasant in the field or a partridge, they need to be a distance away pointing the scent, not the, the actual bird. They don't see the bird, they point the scent. Come on, pup. right now he's just wanting to chase he's not pointing it but we don't let him catch it eventually he should point okay atta boy atta boy well, you want to do that with your new puppy between eight and 10 weeks, they, they should be pointing if they've got a strong pointing desire. Once you've done that and you see your dog a point, take this pole, take this wing, and throw it away. Don't use it anymore. You don't want to overdo that. You've seen eight points, and that's mainly what that's for, to see that a dog will point and has a pointing instinct. After that, normally this puppy at this age wouldn't be seeing that. And I think that's why he's seen it before and he's chasing instead of pointing. He's losing that point. And that's what happens if you overdo it. You wait till they're five, six months old and then get them into actual birds. That's gonna do a lot more for them than if you try to overtrain at a young age between that eight weeks and, and five, six months, what you're gonna end up doing is making more problems and mistakes that you've gotta correct later. You let the dog mature, get the control you need on him Come here, atta boy. Get the control you need on a dog at a young age, and then, and only then, should you get him into the birds, once you have some control in your own yard. And that's another place where I use this check cord and a whistle. I call a dog back to a whistle, and I use a check cord so that he can't get away. I'll demonstrate that right now. And you just lightly bring him hand over hand when you blow the whistle, and if he never gets free where he can run off, he's going to come back. And as, it, as you toot the whistle, you bring your dog in. You let him back out, you praise him, let him back out. We'll see if he'll come to me to the whistle without the tug. Come on. It's just hand over hand, bring him right in. Atta boy, good boy. Good come, good boy. Lots of praise. Huh? Lots of praise. I hang right onto the collar at this point. 
And he's, uh, even your calm, your, your callback at a young age, I use it as a long-term command. He's here until I tell him he can leave. I use an okay as a release for everything. Okay, that a boy. And then he can go out, but only once he's released. Good boy. Atta boy, good boy, good boy. Yeah, I work in my training, work with praise. Uh, I, I know of trainers that work with pain, and if the dog doesn't do what they, they want them to, they, they either use a spike collar or a shock collar, and they get zapped. If you work with praise, you get a dog that's willing to work with and for you, and that's what you want, a dog that has that strong desire to be your companion. They're not just hunting dogs, they're, they're hunting companions. It's, it's your buddy out there in the field hunting with you. And if it's trained properly, that's what you'll have, a dog hunting with you instead of you hunting for the dog. Another thing that I feel is important on training is, is the heel, which I use. Uh, most people wouldn't think in training a dog that that's important, but I use that as a controlling position. When he's at heel, I'm in full control. And from that position is where I'll teach a dog to, to woe, to uh, stand steady to flush, steady to shot. All of this is worked from the heel position where I am in control. Now this pup, I haven't worked much with the heel yet. He's gonna do a little pulling. Plus, working the heel, I use a choke chain so that I have more control. With this flat collar, you're not gonna give a good correction with that. Heel, 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 boy, heel. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, good boy, good boy. Now I think what I want to do, I've shown you that, I'd like to get one of the older dogs and show you a little bit of how it works. Now, you know, this dog, I, I could stand here all day before he'd get it right. I'll bring an older dog in that's been through this and you, then you can understand where I'm going with that. Whoa. This is Coco. She's a five and a half year old short hair, finished hunting dog, and yeah, about as finished as they can be. They're never a hundred percent. You always have a dog to make mistakes. You, you correct them. I don't care how old they are. If they make a mistake, you, you have to correct them. But I figured she would be a good one to show you how to go about woeing your dog. And what I was saying before with the puppy on the, on the woe, stay to flush, stay to shot, and using the heel position to do that. When they're here, I'm in full control. I'll demonstrate right now. Coco, heel. Heel. Whoa. Whoa. Like I said, they make mistakes. She should have stopped right there when she heard the command to whoa. Coco, heel. Whoa. Okay, good girl. Again, you're okay for a release. Once I've got the dog woeing well, then I, then I can use a, uh, something for simulating a flush. Coco, heel. Fetch. Heel. Give. Okay, good girl, good girl. Coco heel. Nothing to stim uh, simulate the flush of a bird like an actual bird. Okay, good girl, good girl, that a girl. It's on its way home right now. From here it's only about 10 miles, but some of these birds have been 200, close to 300 miles, and they're racing homers. And uh, that's something that if, if you have an area you can raise birds, they're an excellent bird for training because you can do this and use them over and over. Uh, I'll take these birds 
20 miles one direction in one day and the next day load them up and head somewhere else to do my training and take the same birds with me. And I've been using these all summer. And they go back home. They go back home. You feed them, you water them, and bring them back the next day. The next step from pigeons is pheasants. The hunting season for wild birds is relatively short, but hunting preserves are open eight months out of the year. Most farm-raised pheasants are sold to restaurants, but Greg Holmes raises them for hunting on his 170-acre preserve near Otter Lake, Michigan. Now, preserves are good places to train dogs and to break youngsters into hunting. Mark Raymond lets his 8-year-old son, Jeff, tote a BB gun while we give Coco some preseason experience on pheasants. On a preserve, the handler can determine where the pheasants are placed and how the dogs approach them. Whoa. You want to go in and flush it out? Will she break a shot? No, she should be steady to the fall. She'll hold up right there, Joe. Try to get it to go out. It's got to be there. She's on a good point now. On a preserve, a bird can be intentionally disoriented and placed in a clump of grass so it sits extremely tight. Now, this isn't done for most preserve hunting, but it is done when the idea is to give the dog some good controlled practice on pointing and retrieving. Second shot. First shot it's a good thing. You didn't, have a, you didn't have a third. It's a good thing. Fetch it up. Now she's found it. She should deliver it to hand. Here she comes. Now, will she come back to your hand? Yeah, she'd probably come to you if you called her right now. Well, I won't. I'll, I'll let you do the honor. Coco, fetch here. Give. Good girl. Good girl, Coco. Lots of praise goes a long way with a dog in practice and in the field during the hunt. Now, how long should a pointer hold before jumping to retrieve? Mark prefers that the dog hold for the shot, which Coco does. She knows my first shot missed. She's holding until she sees the bird start to fall. Now she breaks. A dog trained to hold until it sees the bird drop is a valuable hunting partner and fun to hunt with. Upland bird hunting has lots of benefits. Besides being fun, the constant walking is good exercise, and it's a kind of hunting that a youngster can participate in, even with a wooden gun or an air rifle. I followed my dad with a toy gun for several years before I was allowed to carry a shotgun, but I loved it. You have more hunting success on a preserve. The season is eight months rather than three or four weeks, and we found the Holmes Pheasant Farm to be an extremely beautiful setting. Our main mission was dog training. Coco was excited to find so many pheasants. Her tail buzzed all morning. She'd lock on point and hold like the champion she is. We ended up with some tasty pheasant dinners, and all of us are prepared for Michigan's Wild Pheasant Opener. That'll be starring Mark Raymond and Coco. Be sure to join us next week. I don't know about you folks, but I really enjoyed that training session with Mark Raymond. I always learn a lot from him about training bird dogs. And you know, that's a rewarding activity all by itself. Now, I know that this weekend I'm going to be hunting. I hope you can get outdoors too because it's a great place to be. See you next week. Five and five eighths inch spread. That is one huge nine point. Got this at, uh, on the 20th, so the fifth day of the season with a Remington 870. What's the story? Well, it all started at 7:30. He uh, was bedding down. He stood up, and I just put a new scope on my gun, and it was on seven power. And I thought he was a lot closer than he looked. 
So I shot and completely missed. And in the process, I woke up another guy and he shot and missed. So we went and uh, there was no snow, so we, I watched where he went. We went and looked for him and searched for an hour after we found his tracks and uh, couldn't find no sign of him. And I uh, decided to go through this thicket. It was about a 20 by 30 thicket, real thick. But once you got inside, all it was was pine trees and took a step and looked right and there he laid. Hmm. Well, I mean, had you hit him or not? No, he was just laying there under cover and didn't and you get got up. Him? And you one, got him right there? One shot through the neck. Wow. What a story. That, now, that's not many guys who take out after a deer missing it like that will come across it and find it. But that is one heck of a buck. A nine point with a 25 and 5 eighths inch spread. Congratulations, Mike. Thank you. Good to hear the story behind that.